Okay, hello everyone. Uh, hello one more time. So we today have uh, Marcin Kosinski, uh, who is a data scientist uh, from Poland. He's uh, working for the company called Gradient, right? And he's uh, today and tomorrow is teaching the power summer school. He's teaching a class called the survival analysis, but uh, now the topic is different and. Marcin is also a founder, right, of uh, YR Foundation. So most of you who are working with Python always have this question for us, like YR, YR, YR. Now, uh, so Marcin is the founder of that foundation, YR Foundation, and he's going to talk about Marcin. Um, the segmentation without distances with the help of NMF. Uh, thanks, Habeb, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you guys for joining. I know it's not easy after the full day to have a concentration for one more uh, one more stuff after the work or after the school that you attended maybe today. Uh, so my topic today is the segmentation without distances. And this seems to be more sexy than I previously invented the topic. And Habeb said it's not quite interesting and now I'm going to come. So that's just marketing purposes. But the real topic is this stuff. So I'm going to talk about the NMF, which is non-negative matrix factorization. I know it's disgusting, uh, but it's very, very beneficial. And um, it's a tool that I will use in the segmentation scenario. And the segmentation scenario has that complexity that it requires uh, to work with highly dimensional feature space. And I know that high dimension, high dimension of features uh, is different for anyone. Like I know that biologists work with a lot of features and they have 20,000 of biomarkers they work on a daily basis and that's typical for them. But in the market research area where I work, where we in most cases verify the mindset of people with the survey opinions, we work with 50 questions and that's high, that's much. Because during the survey when respondents are filling the survey, they lost the concentration, 50 questions is too much. And in the end, where we provide uh, the solution, the report, the description of what we've just created, the 50 questions is too much for the CEO checking our reports. Um, so I'm going to describe you how we've used the decomposition for the matrix, uh, for the surveys that we provide in our company, uh, on a real life use case that we've done for the Facebook Foundation. And we detected the teachers and parents' mindsets uh, on the education system. Um, and who am I? Yeah, I'm an, I'm an uh, R enthusiast. Uh, I organize R users, R user group in Poland. I was an active R blogger. And my goal for this year is the YR conference that I would like to strongly invite you. And in the end, I've got some materials. Um, and on a daily basis, I work at Radiant Metrics, for those who don't know yet. Um, we work in the market research area and we try to apply data science techniques. Uh, we've got a global setup, there are four, four people working in a company, and we've got offices in four countries, which means everyone works uh, in a different country. We are working in a few time zones, so that's not always the easiest. And I'm really always very happy to talk to real people that can actually interact with me. So that's also some pleasant uh, moment for me, not just sharing the knowledge, but also uh, meeting new people. So let's get back to the segmentation. So the definition so that we learn on the same page. I will talk about the market segmentation and uh, there is an assumption that on the market, that's a group of customers, that's an audience of some people, like there's audience of teachers or parents that you would like to verify their mindset with a survey. Uh, so there is an assumption that the people that behave somehow as a customers or answers the questions as a respondents in the survey uh, follow similar patterns that you can find groups of patterns in the final survey, and that's how we, would you like to describe the population. Finding groups with similar patterns uh, that actually summarizes the whole thing that is happening in, in, in the specific market or for the specific audience. And so I've got few examples here. Those are surveys. Uh, you can segment. That's the same term for clustering. Uh, the customers for the online retailer. You can do the segmentation for brand awareness. You can just verify whether the people know certain uh, certain brands. You can also do the segmentation for the clients of the bank. Okay, why it's cool, why it's helpful, and uh, why it's sexy. It answers many questions. 
So for example, uh, how many groups are there in the market? What are their, their sizes? And uh, what are the specific characteristics that differentiate segments? So you can imagine there's a survey or there's a database, a lot of features, and you've got those group assignments, but you'd like to know what are the differences between groups. So you'd like to know what are the drivers driving the differences in, 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 in those groups. And also, what's possible for that one, you can assign future customers or future respondents based on the segmentation to the segments. So you might survey a thousand people, and uh, the moment you've got the answers for the, for the same people, for those questions, you can assign them to segments. But that's typically a hard case, since you've got to do the same survey for those people. So during the segmentation, you can extract the most driving variables that differentiates groups, and having top five or top 10 statements, you can use those for the future assignments. So there is also a plus. You make a huge one survey, and then you take the most driving variables into the future survey so that you can map new surveys to the previous groups. So that, that, that's, that's the coolest part that I have learned about so far. Um, yeah, and segmentation can answer the question how you can improve your marketing methods. That's really cool, and a lot of customers ask about the stuff. Um, there are some challenges in the segmentation. So there are challenges related to the, to the data, since you can work with different types of data. Uh, so that's my scenario. I work with the survey data. They have their own challenges. And um, for, the, for, the, for the methods that are used, that's the unsupervised learning. So the groups are not defined at the beginning. It's not like for the prediction where you have training tested and labels. Uh, often it's a mixture of very various types of data, categorical one, multi-select, since during the survey you can select few uh, answers for one question. And there is also a case for the ordinal data, uh, which is like, do you agree with the statement from on a scale one to five, where five is strongly agree and one is strongly disagree, so that's the ordinal data. Another challenge is the extremely huge, that's huge in the survey scenario, uh, feature space, uh, but you can apply those techniques also to different kinds of data. That's not only for surveys, that the NMI that I will describe also helps segment people uh, in, 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 in different markets, not only, not only surveys. And the biggest challenge is actually to have the meaningful story, There's the proper sizes. You can't have one small and one big and non-existing segments. They got to have the description, how do, are they different from the other segments, and they got to play the story all together. Uh, so those are the challenges. Those are the challenges. And how you typically observe the data. So when verifying the mindset of teachers or parents on their view on the education, you ask people typical statements. Uh, do you think the school is responsible for the education? Or do you think the parents is re are responsible for the education? Teachers and parents are asking that they agree, disagree. We've got some demographic variables, the race, the age bucket, the gender. Um, and it's not just like you survey everyone. This is more targeted. So uh, if you like to have an inference for a population, like let's say the whole United States population, then you also got, need to gather the data in the same format. So if there, if there is specific ratio for females and males in the population, you would also like to have those in your data. You would also like to observe the same for the race. Uh, you would like to have specific amount of white people, Asian people, and that's the same for age packets. So that's not that straightforward, but panel providers that you use to collect the sample are supporting this process. Okay, and in the typical segmentation, like uh, after the presentation, we've got a workshop then where we can walk through, uh, we see the data, apply traditional techniques for the clustering, and also apply the NMF st uh, strategy. Uh, what you do is you try to get the distance, the metric, that uh, stands for uh, similarity between respondents, and then you would like to have the distance matrix that presents the uh, distance between observation, that's the distance between the first and the second respondent, first and the third, and you see that it's closer for the first one to the second one than to the third one. And based on that stuff, uh, which is probably on the heat map, you would like to create the segmentation. And most, most of the techniques work when the distance matrix is specified. And why it's not uh, applicable most of the times? Because there are, so many, there are so many distances that you could pick from, and they have so different properties are, and are designed for specific cases that when you have a lot of features, 
some of the metrics doesn't work. They don't, uh, they don't follow their properties. They lost their properties. Like Euclidean distance works in 3D, in 4D, but not in 50D. 50 variables for the Euclidean distance is too much. Some of the distances are just meant for categorical data. What if, if we have the, what if we have the mixture? Um, and there's often a requirement for the feature selection. So you get 50 questions, but you would like to segment people, and at the same time, get the feature extraction, the main drivers. You don't need the, noise, the noisy variables. Um, and also, the feature grouping, if they share the similar information, you would like to have some indi indication that few features are giving the same are giving the same information. So that's why we are not using the traditional clustering techniques that we will also cover after the presentation, but we are using something different. Okay, and now we are here for the non-negative matrix factorization. Uh, and I'm really glad I can speak in English because in Polish that the translation is really awkward. I don't know if there's any Armenian translation. We can try. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe better not. I've heard the brainstorm being translated yesterday, and it was weird. In Armenian brainstorm, in Armenian how brainstorm. was it translated? Which was? Matagero. Okay, I'll let keep it in. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that's yeah. not terrible, right? So, so even for Polish, I like to keep uh, the English language version. Um, okay, all right. So yeah, that was a small, small, uh, small joke. Let's get back to the topic. So the NMF stands for the full family of algorithms, and I'm going to describe one version of the whole setup that you could use. So you start with the data, the tidy, the tidy version which has uh, respondents as rows and answers to the statements as columns. And what you would like to achieve is the decomposition to two other matrices. And uh, what's really important, the one matrix has the same number of rows as the original one, and that states for the respondents. And here we've got columns that states for the features. And there is a hidden dimension called rank, factorization rank, and it is also states for number of groups. And what you would like to have from uh, this decomposition and what is the reasoning and what are the biggest benefits is that this matrix stands for the segmentation. You've got people and assignments to the segments, and you pick the biggest one. Okay, if those are the numbers 0 and 1, you take the second uh, segment. If, the, if it's 5 and 3, you take the first segment. So that's easy. And what's really important and what's really cool about that stuff is you've got the same for features. You've got features and their loadings on this, uh, on this hidden dimension. So for the first statement, let's call it first feature, you also got numbers and the higher indicates that this feature is highly visible in that group. And it means that in that group, actually, people uh, are over or under indexing this question, which means they strongly disagree in comparison to, to, to the rest of the population, or they strongly agree. So this, this gives the segment assignments, and this stuff gives us what features describe which groups. So that's two ducks with the one stone, two dusts, two pigeons with one stone, and we've got the segment assignments and we've got the description. And during the workshop, we're gonna see how those look like. And there is one more requirement that is put on this decomposition. So it's not just the decomposition, but there is a requirement that those matrices should be sparse. And that means like the more zeros, the better. And the more zeros, the better because you've got uh, direct assignments. So if there are many zeros and just numbers, so you know that this person is assigned to this group and this feature explains this specific, this, this specific group. Okay. Do you think this might work? Anyone is convinced? I, I'm convinced this works. Uh, uh, so your features are only the statements? Uh, you, uh, no? Yeah, in this example, yeah, they are they are the statement. You could also add the demographic characteristics, uh, but those are the categor categorical data. You should uh, hold them as you know dummy variables, and also you could use the continuous uh, features but they've got to be scaled on the same scale as the other ones, so there is no influence of the scale on the factorization. So for numeric features, you can also learn some segmentation? You could, you could use all the features. I am here using the statements for the explanatory reasons, mm -hmm. 
that you could also have the, I know, if there was a registered income for a person, you could use the income as a continuous. One more question. So, uh, in the end, are you going to have some interpretation for, for the segments, or you're just going to have yeah, we, we, we're going to have um, uh, segment assignments, segment descriptions by, by, the, by the discovered variables. And maybe I can share some story of what was created. Can I have one question? Yeah. Uh, so uh, in terms of the output, uh, just the output, uh, how, how different is this like from the traditional, I don't know, factor analysis or principal component analysis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that, that's often the question. So um, for, for the principal component analysis, uh, which reduces the dimension of characteristics, it's, it shows you the data in the, in the new dimensions that were, were the, where the size is smaller, but still the full information from the original data is covered in, 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 the, in, those, in those new dimensions as they are li linear combination. And what we are getting here in comparison to what was the other option? Factor Factor analysis. Analysis. Factor analysis. That's, that's, that's almost quite the same. Here you can have zeros for first segment here and zeros here and numbers here. So you stay with the same amount of features and you know that those explain this segment this okay. and there is some information and those explain this one. And in the PCA there is this hard combination to get back to. Okay. okay. You are convinced? Yeah. Thank you. Neil, you are convinced that's going to work? Okay. There are three of us, that's good. Looking forward, okay, one math slide that I have. Uh, so if you are an R programmer, you might be interested in the only R snippet in this presentation. So that's really convenient. You run the NMF function from the NMF package. You provide the, 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 the data. You input the rank. And watch out, I haven't yet said how to determine the rank. So there are procedures to extract the rank. Uh, then you specify the method, because that's a group of things, and you specify the seed. So, what are the methods, what are the seeds, what's the purpose? So, at the beginning, we would like to find two matrices that minimize the cost function, and uh, here we would like to have the multiplication of those two decomposed matrices to be as close as possible to the original one, and we also got a special regularization part and that puts the requirement on those two matrices to be sparse. Is it you know, only in my head or it's happening? <laughs> it's reacting to your voice, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So it's never going to be very close because there is regularization and, there, and it's never going to be very sparse because it got, it's got to be close. So there is some compromise. We've got the, the composition that has both of the features and then, then there is a compromise. And uh, the method technique actually stands for how you optimize the function, what are the techniques used, whether that's gradient descent or the one or the two or stuff. I'm not that smart to get these details. And also, there is an option to specify the distance between those matrices. Okay, there is an example default, some kind of provenient distance. Um, and what what is the seed for? So you start with those matrices and you input randomly selected values from the original data, and then you have the starting points. You've got the method for the optimization, and you end the moment you reach the minimum or there is uh, enough iterations that you require. So that's the random starting point, which means you might end up with some ridiculous solutions. So what you typically do, you repeat the stuff 30 times, and in the end, from this decomposition, you take means. And it might happen that the uh, segments are switched because of the random start. So you gotta reorder the thing. So they follow the, the, the same pattern, like segment one in this decomposition is the same as segment one in this decomposition based on the features and the rows they specify. And then you can take the mean. So that was the hardest part. We've got, we've got it covered. And now the use case. Okay, so that was actually used in, the, in, 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 our, uh, in our research. Uh, just, just one question about the previous slide. Do you know how the uh, our factors are kept non-negative during the optimization? 
how the factors are. Because if you go by gradient descent, that, uh, that's possible to go to negative numbers as well. So is it cut by zero or do you know it? Should. Should. Well, okay. Never thought about that. Mm -hmm. Never thought about that. That it can be that far away. Uh, so you've got all the positive values in those matrices, and somehow in the estimation you reach the negative value. Uh, you, can, you can go to negative values by gradient descent. Okay. Okay. Um, and one more question: You said you you average out the result of many runs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the, uh, how do you handle the uh, permutation of the... Yeah, so I just described. So you can have uh, two runs for rank two, mm -hmm. and they have to be permuted. Mm -hmm. So you can have call sums, row sums, to determine the order. Okay, you do by, by the, to understand Yeah, the that's, that's silly, but that's one of the solutions. And you do it only for, for the two-factor case, because if you do it for more factors, then, then the permutations are... Yeah, there are more permutations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so based, based, based on that, you, you could, you could um, get the order. For example, you've got one matrix for, for which you've got call sums, and then you've got another one, you've got the call sums, okay. There's the order of some of the problems, maybe it should be reordered to follow this order, and that's the order for two, you do the same. So check all the permutations? The software does it for you, you don't do that. Okay, there was one more. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, whether that uh, averaging is really important. Like, couldn't you just round the gradient descent for more iterations and then check that your loss over iterations doesn't suffer? Um, you know, the starting point, it's always better to run multiple times. Okay, the real use case. So there was a survey that we made, kind of 50 statements, uh, find reasonable number of groups for teachers' population with valuable sizes, so they, they can't be very small, can't be very big, uh, with meaningful descriptions, so they've got to be features that are visible for in, the, in one group and not in the other groups. Uh, and uh, it, it's good to be if it's built on a small number of features as possible. So in the final summary, if you can extract eight features that differentiate the, the groups, then that's, that's awesome. And uh, what's the approach uh, for finding the number of groups? We haven't talked about it yet. So you start those 30 runs for case that can be from 2 to 10, I mean the rank. And for every, for every case that you detected, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and, and so sorry, K is the number of the clusters? K is the number of clusters, the ranks, yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, you can then check the stat statistical goodness of fit for the segmentation and the decompositions. So um, that's a, the dispersion for, that stands for the reproduci reproducibility of the decomposition. The silhouette, that's a statistical measure that verifies how good uh, a certain observation fit to its segment in comparison to the closest one, and you can take the mean for, for every observation, and the sparseness for the decomposition. Uh, and that's how you can ensure that picking the right K actually was motivated by some statistical rules, but also there are some uh, business requirements that it can't be let greater than 10, and it rather shouldn't be free because that's too small. Uh, and also what helps you to determine what's the proper, what's the proper clustering uh, segmentation and, 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 the, and the big K is something called consensus clustering. So for these 30 calls, you can uh, then find out whether, whether the features are uh, pointing to the same segment, so they are in the same segment, and based on the 30 runs, you can have the coherence matrix, how many times this, the same features were together in the same segment. And based on those, you can then plot the consensus matrix. It's going to be better visible if I'm going to show you the plot. And based on those, you know whether in random runs the features are pointing to the same group or not. If they are pointing to the same group, that's good. If they are randomly pointing to random groups, not always the same, that's bad. Um, yeah, so those are the, those are the um, goodness of heat plots. So we've got the... Uh, we've got a thing that stands for the 
uh, reproducibility for the best fit within the RAM, that is the closest uh, in terms of the minimization. We also got the plots for the sparseness, and we've got two matrices. The green one is for variables, the red one is for respondents, that's the same here, the silhouette. Uh, the greater the better, the greater the better. So when you lose the statistical uh, features, you get, you get the sparseness. And also it's getting better in terms of stability when it's, when it's greater than 5 to 6. Uh, and there's also a consensus clustering that can have the same uh, reasoning for the silhouette that stands for the proper, uh, proper assignment to a specific group. And based on those plots, which, which K would you recommend for the end client? Five. Five. Okay. Any other options? Five is not that bad, but has really weak stability. Um, so you don't see the most crucial part, which are the segment sizes. Um, so it might be like that for the solution equal to five. There is one huge segment and four smalls, which is not the best. And here in this situation, we in the end picked seven, since one segment was really small and we rejected the segment and two other were uh, having the same interpretation. They were having the same variables that describe them. So we could group. So based on the, on the actual k equal to seven, we ended, we ended up with five, uh, with five segments. So that's not the full story. You also got to look at the sizes and at the values that come from the decomposition. So that was a trick. It's really hard to guess uh, just by those, just by those um, plots. And the consensus clustering that I uh, that I promised to show. So one, once again, that's for k equal to four, k equal to six. Uh, you might please remember the process: thirty runs, in the end, thirty assignments for features to certain groups, and based on the concurrence, whether they were in the same group, we can have the concurrence matrix, which is a distance matrix, and we build the hierarchical clustering. And what is displayed here? Those are those features here and here. And the middle bar presents the consensus clustering groups here, if it's not visible. And you see highly concurrence within those features that are in one segment. Uh, and the, the smaller bars, which means they do not concur with those from the different segment sizes. And also the bar that presents uh, the silhouette, which is quite high for, for, a single, for a single feature. And it's not that good for the k equal to 6. Uh, since those here are two segments, the one and another, and they co-occur, and they do not strongly occur uh, inside the segmentation. So based on that, in this scenario, I don't remember whether it's for teacher or, or for parents, I, I would pick four instead of six in this case. So based on that, that plots, the sizes, the description, and the consensus matrix, which stands for the consensus, you are able to determine what's, what's, what's the case. Um, and, and it's not that simple, I needed to look at that for a week or two to actually grasp the idea, but the slides will be slides will be available, so there's 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 a place to start. Um, okay, so there's this whole machinery. We do the survey, uh, clients uh, influence the survey structure, the questions. Then we get the data. Uh, then we do this. We do the we do the segmentation, and in the end, what's what's reported? Uh, it's actually such a such a small such a small um, tables where we present the methodology that we've used, k equal to four, five, or six, uh, and we report the silhouette scores. I will talk about it more in a bit. The dispersion and what's crucial, the largest segment for for segment for the solution for four segments is not that big, and the smallest one it's not that small. If there are six segments. And also the best solution for other techniques with the silhouette score and the number of segments for which the silhouette score was the highest. So we see that it, it, that, that's too small and the silhouette scores are also small. Uh, and there is a huge difference between the non-negative matrix approach and the silhouette score. Uh, but to be honest, it's not just the NMF. It's kind of a bit mixed with the factor analysis. So it's not just the NMF, but it was kind of level higher, more complicated. But you can think about it like that. Those are the differences in the typical approach and in the approach where you are digging and digging and in the end you find the solution. 
more people convinced right now? So, so yeah, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Galara is used mostly for the uh, like very high dimensional data, right? Mm -hmm. Like many rows, or it can be used for the small data as well. I think like every technique can be used to any type of data, uh, whether if, if it's you know if it brings a good solution. So based on those scores, that doesn't look that any of those looked looked good. Uh, and if there is special requirement about Clara, so it should work. I don't know. I have no idea if there is any any special. Uh, and special numbers, that should be the minimum. And then we also present the story, so it's not only numbers, but we've got the segment, the size, uh, that's the follow the guidebook teacher, and based on the, on the cell values for the columns, the composition, we know to which features, which, which features look at, and we can create the story. Those are the over-index variables, those are the under-index variables, uh, we report the percentage of people that agrees with statements, those uh, that also agrees with the under-index statements, and those are those that are not visible in this segment in comparison to the full population, and those are highly visible. And there is, and there is uh, a number. That means that uh, when you take the proportion of people that agrees in this statement, to the proportion of people that agrees in the whole population, uh, there is the ratio is and the, mini, uh, and the baseline is 100, the, the ratio is 300, so it's three, three times more uh, visible to agree with the statement to the comparison with the full population. So that's the description for the segment. And that's the follow the guidebook teacher because they reported that they uh, think that stud students should be treated equally and, um, and education should not be, uh, how you call it, personalized. That's why it's to follow the guidebook teacher in the story. So follow the same patterns all over and all, all over the time, and no improvement in the education system. Uh, getting to the to the end notes. Uh, yeah. So it has the start point. So you are. It's better to redo it a couple of times. Uh, the rank selection is the crucial part. You've seen that it was really. Not that easy to determine whether it should be five or six segments. In the end, we show the solution for few case and then the client decides what brings the best story and the feature classing is provided like mm, uh, you're gonna see the heat maps in the workshop and you're gonna see the groups on those heat maps like the the factorization we had this this factorization we had uh, those are values and we can also have the the heat map based on those values and we can also cluster uh, cluster the thing and we can, we can see groups that the, the features are in the specific groups since they are describing the same segments. Um, okay. Yeah, and the credits, it's not our solution. It's the CRAM package called NMF. We are just the users. Uh, we, are not, we are not the software developers. We don't, like all the credits goes to, goes to authors. And um, if you like the talk, I strongly invite you to join the WIRE conference that is happening this September uh, in Warsaw. And I hope you enjoyed the, the talk since that was a part of our marketing trip. And I'm really glad I'm here in Armenia for, uh, for the invitation that Habit sent to me. And uh, if you would like to join the R conference and listen to similar talks, we can talk about like how to get to the, to the, to the Warsaw in the cheapest way or how to get a discount for the conference. And yeah, thanks for listening listening to me. I know it wasn't easy. And if you have any, any questions, I'm free to answer. And I hope we can also go for a beer and talk more about the stuff. Um, okay, one there, one over there. Yeah, you can go first. Yeah, so I was wondering whether uh, you have encountered a case where um, sometimes you have other uh, constraints on the, on the segments. For instance, you don't want so I'm thinking of a segment as a cluster. So you have other constraints such as I don't want the age, for instance, to vary too much within a cluster. Or I want the gender to vary. So I don't want to have like boys in one group and, mm -hmm. and, and girls in the other group. So do you know how, how, how to deal with this kind of stuff? I've never done it so far for this case, but I think the, the, 
but that just my guess that the that, that the scale of the variable is is an influential factor for the factorization. But <coughs> I'm just guessing. Yeah, you probably That's can my stick it into the loss function somehow. Or yeah, or you could. Objective. Or you could yeah. That's better than mine. Okay, so we can now get to the workshop part. Um, so guys, if you would like to redo the analysis and see actual decomposition and uh, see the heat maps, um, there is a special GitHub repository where you can download the materials from. You guys, the Wi-Fi password, uh, the hotspot is AUA guest, and the password is AUA guest 357. Yeah. So uh, in the next, I think, 45 minutes till 60, depending on how fast we are, we're going to just run the code to redo the analysis. Uh, can you uh, post this link to the Facebook event page? I could, I could also. Uh, I'll, I'll post it uh, I'm posting the link on the uh, event page Yeah, I just try to find it like that. So. Okay, and if you are on the on the page, uh, depending how familiar are you with the kit, if not, there is a green green button, download, and you can download the zip. Same link that you put on the Facebook, right? I, I hope. Go to repositories, we find the. I'll check. Yeah, I copied, I copied it. Oh, I put it into the R Yerevan users instead of. Yeah, the yeah, so. Okay. In the you better, yeah, it's like that, so you can just. Okay, posting again. You can't post on the event page, you need to get some. Uh, Approval, but I think that it's funny when people can find it. So. And then you click download, and when you unzip, Double 
and you should see that kind of setup. Here is the project name. Uh, here are all the materials that are needed. And here we will do the coding on the next OK, so um, who's ready with the setup? You, you are all good? We can wait. Okay. Because that's crucial, and then I'm going to speed up. Got the code. So yeah, those, those, those people that are ready can go to scripts, and then there is a script read data, and at the beginning you can install the dependencies if you think you don't have those packages. Uh, and then you can hit library. Library. So there are a few techniques to run the code in R. The moment you are in the line, you can just run Control Enter, or you can select the full line and press Run on the top. And still, when the full line is selected, you can still run Control Enter. What is the survey about? Uh, uh, it's mindset. The sorry. mindset on the education. Wow. Mindset on the education. Okay. Mm. So I'm going to start slow so that we can then follow up. The line 4 re reads the survey. And the next few lines uh, just create the dictionary for the column names and the column labels. Since you can check, it shouldn't be regular data frame. Uh, yeah. So you can see most of the data are collected as an SPSS file, which means they have names and labels. And the moment you go to the view, you can click on the on the data name. And when you go to the view, you see that there is a question and then and, and, and there is an extra label. Our education system is not supported to install a common understanding, understatement, stuff like that. And the answers coded one so we disagree, five agree. Uh, and we can also have we can also create the dictionary with the next few lines. And by dictionary, I mean just presenting the head of the set that we've got. Uh, that we've got the column name and the actual label that was displayed for the respondent. And the survey data, like first, first five rows and columns. And we see that the class is double this label because it actually 
has numbers that have labels. So we see that phi stands for agree, one for uh, disagree, and also I wrote that down. And we can check just one, co just one column to see that this special type of the data called label has an extra attribute labels that display you what the dictionary did for the label. Okay, that's how we read the data and we can uh, run a few simple statistics that's still the same script. Okay, simple statistics present us the mean for each question, the, med the median, standard deviation, and uh, that's the same with the dictionary. The, with the dictionary. So we can see that the st statement number 13, I want my child to be the best at whether she, he carries that being at the top of the class, she, whether she cares, is uh, the statement that those people, that those are, this is for parents, uh, that these people actually agree. And they disagree with the statement, report card grades should, be, should compare students against each other, that uh, the education shouldn't be personalized. So parents disagree. It should be personalized. All right, so that's just the script, the first one to read the data. Uh, have, have you managed to read the data? I think so, yeah. I, I can see your faces. So two more scripts. Two more scripts, guys. Uh, next script, O2, traditional segmentation. So we will use the CL valid package that does all the stuff for us. So you can install the package if you don't have it. You can load the package if it's not load it. Uh, we can set the random seeds since few of those algorithms have running procedures or running starting points. And we will run uh, the clustering for the survey data the moment we change labels to numerics. And we will run it for k from the range equal to 3 to 9. And we will use all the, hey, all the parents. And the method, methods that we will use is the list of typical ones, hierarchical k-means, partition, partitioning around methods, and, and the one that I don't uh, really know. All right, so what it does, it runs for those various k's, I mean runs, the n class, from, from 3 to 9, it runs those algorithms, and then uh, it summarizes the fit. We can see a few statistical measures like the connectivity done, the silhouette, and uh, the, interpretation, the interpretation is that the done and the silhouette should be as big as possible and the connectivity should be as small as possible and for all those methods on the left and in, and in columns we've got case, number of groups, we've got all the statistics that are reported and also give, give us the optimal scores. Like the best Solution here is a hierarchical clustering with three classes, but that's not much. And the silhouette score is kind of poor. Uh, you can just get the optimal scores if you don't care about anything else. And you can also see the plots. The same metrics are on plots. The connectivity again for various methods for various number of case. Uh, the done and the silhouette. And then there is also a line. I'm speeding up because the last script is the most important. And the last line tells you how to extract the segment assignments, so you can always get the segment assignments uh, for, for those different, different methods. And from the object, we can extract the parts of the cluster ops, and then there are four methods for which we can extract the clustering assignments for k equals 3, 4, till 9. So we know how to do the traditional clustering, and now we, we will get to the fun part, which is the NMS segmentation. Um, and I'm going to slow a bit here. So we can load packages, and then we can prepare the data. Uh, it should be a matrix with integ integers as a starting point. So I'm preparing a survey as a matrix. All good, guys? Here, going is Mm -hmm. So maybe you can just follow what, what the guys are doing. And you finish the first script. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Just, just no. Okay, so you might go to the third one, and I'll stop and I'll wait for you. Yeah, let's do the third one. Segmentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the third one. The NMF segmentation. Mm -hmm. And how far are you I think it doesn't work because you are not the 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 Yeah. Like go, go one level higher, I think. Yeah, and try to extract this one. Okay. Anywhere? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna help you until you go. Yeah, because this path data stands yeah. only for this project, so we couldn't read the data there. Okay. Yeah. 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 Try running the fourth and then you will know. Try running the fourth. Mm -hmm. Just the fourth, just the fourth. Just the fourth. Uh, this one? The fourth. Uh, the fourth. Like fourth. Ah, fourth. Ah, ah, ah. This includes. Oh. Yeah, you've got everything you need. Uh. Mm -hmm. And then the next one? We need to also detail that. Oh yeah, we did in the first one. We yeah. Yeah, we did. Okay, so. Okay, I hope we are all there. Uh, Twenty more minutes, and we are heading for a beer. I hope. Uh, can you? Okay. <coughs> so I'm getting the survey data in the matrix format. I'm at the line six here. And then normally you would run line 13 to create those three runs for those case from 3 to 9. But it takes some time. So I've run it before 
I stored the model, and you can just read the model. So it's five minutes less. So we can read the data, uh, read the model. So you already have the model saved because it's taking uh, too much time? Like not too much, like five to ten minutes. But it's not always much. Good. It's much. <laughs> You know, you, you, people can get bored in five minutes, and I don't have that many jokes. Um, yeah. So we've got this full model that has those 30 runs for those various cases, and we can plot some stuff. So the moment you run the plot for this object, and you specify what you would like to have to be plotted, then you get this dispersion yeah. um, stuff. The Martin, was, sorry, uh, can you explain this plot? Just in more details. One, once more. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. maybe so what is the best fit? So. So why dispersion is only calculated for the best fit, and then for the others you have. Yeah. That's a good question. So um, within 30 runs, there is one that is the closest, the minimum within the minimum function, uh -huh. and that's the one. That's that's the best fit. Okay. So what is the basis? The basis is the matrix for respondents. Uh -huh. The coefficients is a matrix for variables. Uh -huh. So that's why we have the sparseness for those two, because we decompose matrix to two new ones, and we calculate the sparseness for, for, for this solution. And silhouette is for the segmentation, red is for the respondents, green is for variables, and the pink one is for this consensus that we saw the concurrence of variables will be with the rows. So a higher dispersion is better, or it should be smaller, better? Higher, better. Higher, better. Well, silhouette, higher, better. What about the sparseness? Also. Mm -hmm. Higher, better. Also higher, better. So you've got the confusing information here and here. And also you would like to have some solutions around 4 and 6. Uh -huh. And that's not the best here. So that's always a compromise. There is no golden rule. There is a compromise. You've got to check the sizes. Uh, you gotta check different plots. So let's maybe have a look on some more plots. So the moment you run this for loop, it goes for I've trimmed solutions so we don't look at all of them. It goes through for solutions uh, k equal to three, five, and seven, and it creates few plots for each k from three, five, seven. It creates the consensus map that I showed during the presentation. That's the one, and it creates uh, the heat map for respondents decomposition and the curve map is the heat map for variables decomposition. So the moment you run the code, this one, you can see in the plots directory some plots. So let's open uh, the first one, basis free row false. Okay. So you remember the decomposition was decomposed to the row, uh, to the respondents and to the variables, and that's the matrix. That's the matrix for respondents. Uh, that is normalized, so the row sums to one, and we can see that uh, this respondent has high value in the third, in the third segment, and this has the uh, high values in the first segment. Those are in the middle one, and we can also uh, order that stuff so we lose the order of respondents but we can actually see uh, the groups so the second plot with the row of true that's the second one also uses the hierarchical clustering on on rows so that we see uh, how do they how how do they group so based on on the reordered heat map you can see that the group actually the groups actually exist and they are visible. It's not just uh, random noise in, 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 in this algorithm. So what's more interesting, let's see right now uh, maybe the QF map for uh, five. The QF map, that's for, that's for features. And we see features here. Uh, the values are normalized to sum up to one in the columns. And uh, those features have High values for the high values for the last segment. Those describe the first segment. Those are visible for the second. 
and the rest is not that important, not, not that outstanding as those results. Um, and we also have the consensus clustering, so how they grew up, how they group in the consensus. So not that good this time for this solution. The consensus should be rather if the if the noise is high, they should they, if, the, if, the, if the signal is high in this segment, they should also be in the same uh, segmentation group. And that's and that's the clustering uh, that you have for respondents that the groups are represented also by by the columns. So there's transition between uh, when there was a matrix for variables, there's a transition between rank and and the rank and the rank for respondents. And that's that's the segmentation. So the solution equal to five doesn't look that good. For free we know how to interpret the the heat map for the basis segmentation. And let's see the consensus map consensus map for let's say seven. And the consensus here is again in the middle. So we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Kind of not not consensus here. And those rather should occur often. So those solutions are not uh, not always that effective and not always that good. Um, so you need to you need to verify. You need to have a look at that stuff. Mm. Okay. So what we can get also from the fit. So if you look at the line 39, you can check the structure of the object. So the object has a special uh, field called fit where it stores those matrices. Uh, so the moment you would run the line 39, you would know that you can get those matrices uh, for respondents and for columns with, with this run. So that's la line 40. That's line 40. And you get those uh, segment assignments for respondents. So the first one should rather be assigned to group 2, but it's close to group 3. The other one should be assigned to group 1, and so on. The third one to group 4. And we can have the same for columns. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So we're looking at the respondents. Where groups for k equal to 3 this time. This is when you're is rounded and k is equal to 2 or 3? Uh, it's rounded to two digits after the... So what this means, 1.86, like uh, the first line? Yeah. Those are just... Uh, just them. Okay. Those are unex unexplainable numbers. They just show you the magnitude of how you... So how you know which one belongs to which group? Uh, you pick the biggest. Ah. You pick the biggest. Okay. Mm -hmm. And on the heat maps you saw the normalized versions, so you can also okay. treat it as like uh, probability assignments. Okay, and the breakdowns, the next line, 45, what are the sizes of groups? So we see for the line 45, what are the sizes? Uh, segmentation equal to 3, so so split segmentation equals 5. Okay, we, we see one small segment and segmentation equal to 7. Uh, yeah, and there was one group that we removed and two segments that we joined, so that's fine. And, and, and the speeds are good. There is no huge one and no, 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 no small one. But actually, we, we removed one. Um, the next line, you can get the predictions, which is which are the assignments for respondents. So that's the head. First six people are assigned to segment five, four, five, five, one, one. You can get the sizes. And what I'm gonna also present uh, is based on some helper functions. And if you run those next lines uh, from line 60 till 70 till 72, it might take some time. I'm calculating this index to verify what variables are visible in which segments to compare whether the NMF already told me this story. So for k equal to 3, 5, and 7, I'm calcula calculating question breakdowns. How many people disagree? How many people have no opinion and how many people agree. Let's see for the k equal to 3 what, what I meant. Okay, so there is one question and in segment 1, 33 people have no opinion, 31 people disagree, 35 agree, and in the, in the whole population, not divided to segments, 45% of people agree. 
and based on the proportion of people that agree to the, to the population, we are able to uh, determine that this is visible variable that could describe the segment 2 in solution equal to 3. And that's what you would do if you just have the segment assignments, and, but you don't have the story, you don't have the features that uh, already are pointing to segments. You can just go and calculate this index. So we've got a function that calculates the index. So let's use this function. Line 77 gives us such a story. Gives us such a story that the top five over index variables, uh, segment one solution equal k to three top five variables, that uh, those, are those top variables have high indexes, so they are more visible here than in the typical, uh, than in the population, and what's the percentages of people that agreed. And now we can compare this manually calculated index to what's presented by, uh, to what's presented by the NMF. So we can look at the matrix that stands for, that stands for those variables. Uh, that numbers are just rounded to two and we extract those variables that are over indexed to verify what NMF said. And uh, that was for the segment one, and they have the biggest numbers in the segment one. So that's how you get from the NMF to the, to the variables that explains the segment. So this is something like uh, the uh, factor loadings? <laughs> Could be, but uh, yeah. By interpretation. It could be, yeah, you can, you can interpret that. Uh, but by factors, in most cases, yeah, that's the factor of okay. Yeah. So for those, for those five questions that are actually the most over-indexed in this segment, they were already presented uh, in this matrix that decomposes uh, variables. And also there were five uh, uh, under-indexed that people rather do not agree. And uh, those are with the smallest numbers for this specific segment. And that's how I believed in the NMF segmentation, that the numbers he provides, the under index are the lowest, uh, the over index are the highest, and that's placed with the actual index calculations. Uh, so, so mindset 37. Uh, no, the, uh, the very one where we have two, k is equal to two. So it's mindset 11, 0 0.89. Uh, can you just explain what it means? Yeah. This one? Yeah. So now we are looking at uh, k equal to three. Uh -huh. The matrix for variables. It's really long, this matrix uh -huh. for variables. So maybe I will just... Okay, okay, and why is then it's uh, another argument, two, what it means? And the two is just to round the numbers. Round, round, right, yes, from in round. In this matrix, there are having 16 digits. So 0 0.189 means that, uh, so you, I'm looking by the columns, and the maximum that I get is showing this that the given... Is the segment that is described by this variable. So all these variables are describing segment one. Yes, and I've picked those because, because I've checked that they are over indexed, but you can do it other way. Look at the NMF and then you see, okay, okay that plays with the over index. And you can redo for the rest of the stuff that this, this is uh, true for the rest. Okay. Uh, that the over and under index are just playing the same story. And that's all I wanted to present you guys. Uh, then there is a full procedure to describe segments into meaning, meaningful story, the report presenting the stuff, but that's not the, the work that I do in my company. But in my opinion, that's the really valuable skill to gather those results and create the story and present the report and be convincing during the presentation. So if you ever wanted, if you ever wondered, uh, can a data scientists go further? So I would, I would tell you to invest in those, in those uh, I don't know, soft skills. Yeah. I'm done. If you've got any questions, Thank you. Hey. Thank you.